Sir Richard, um, <coughs> members of the faculty of Gresham, um, ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues and family, it is a quite unbelievable honour for me to um, become this 37th Gresham Professor of Physics and to take a sort of place in the history of going back to Elizabethan times. Um, I'm well aware of the achievements of my predecessors and it's been a real treat for me to meet some really, really smart people who do other things um, than medicine who uh, I've met since I became involved with Gresham. So thank you very much. Um, and by the side of your seat you'll have found a small box which contains props that you're going to need later, so don't lose it um, and we'll, we'll come back to it. Now, it, it is uh, for my family, my wife and um, son Beckon and I, are particularly poignant that we can uh, be here and that I can deliver these lectures in the Museum of London. Uh, we um, sponsored part of the timeline that runs around the Museum of London in um, 1983 in memory of my son Toby who died in 2009. And if I may, I'd like to dedicate the rest of these lectures tonight and in the future to, to his memory. So let's um, start by thinking about the heart and why it might be interesting. Um, I am a paediatric cardiac surgeon and I've spent more than 35 years doing it. Uh, but it's, a, it's an extremely small specialty and why should it have any interest to a general audience of any kind? It's reasonable to ask why it is relevant. Uh, particularly when you look at it in the context of the problems of healthcare in the world, uh, congenital anomalies don't cause many deaths in the early part of life, and yet they're associated with quite a big investment. Congenital heart disease is, only, is less than 1% of live births, and only half of those need any real treatment. If we really want to do something, we should be solving the problem of undernutrition around the world, which accounts for 35% of child deaths, child deaths, usually associated with infection. So why am I boring you with this topic? Well, the Millennium Goals suggested it would be a really good idea to reduce the under-5 childhood mortality, and we've actually done quite well in reducing it, but more than half of that reduction has come from just managing diarrhoea, pneumonia, and measles. And in congenital anomalies, uh, we've hardly made any difference at all. So why am I telling you all this stuff? Well, the main reason that I wanted to talk about it is that the story of the surgery for congenital heart disease pretty well parallels the length of my life. Open heart surgery began in 1952, and I was born in 1951. And this is a specialty which has seen really quite remarkable shifts in the way medical care takes place. So it's a window, a lens through which we can look at what happened in medicine in the latter part of the 20th and the early part of the 21st century. That lens is interesting because it wasn't just technical advances. We've seen disruptive change in the introduction of a heart-lung machine, in the introduction of computing, uh, and more recently in advances in imaging, some of which I'll show you later today. But it's also been uh, a front line of political problems. It's been one of the first specialties which has put its outcomes out there for everybody to see, to be transparent. And that's been both a benefit uh, and a hazard if you work in the profession, to have your name in the newspapers every year. Members of our profession have also been pretty, front, pretty up front about telling the world what we've done and how great we are. Uh, and, and not being so satis satisfied with ourselves when um, we don't do well, when the media remain interested and tell bad stories about us. Now, uh, one of the reasons I want to talk to you is that it's been a success as well. This graph covers the mortality for surgery for congenital heart disease pretty well from when I was born, 1951, to now. And during that time, the mortality for surgery for congenital heart disease has fallen dramatically. In Great Ormond Street at the moment, it's 2% or less. When I went into the discipline, the newspaper headlines were all about hole in the heart, baby lives. And it looked like a really cool job to do, to be a heart surgeon, uh, with all of that um, glory and fame coming my way. Things have changed, however, and if you read the newspapers these days, you're much more likely to come across a headline which says, hole in the heart, baby dies. 
Uh, public expectations have risen. Our ability to deliver high-quality results has been uh, ever improving. But that publicity and that relationship with the public uh, will be the subject of one of my uh, later lectures. The heart has been special to people for thousands of years. And um, Professor French uh, from Cambridge in 1978 said, man naturally has a great curiosity about the nature of his insights. Well, that's true. We're all a bit curious about what happens. And probably the first recorded mention of someone understanding that the heart had a real role in life comes from this chap called Gilgamesh, who was king of a place called Uruk in Mesopotamia. And as usual in that part of the world, they were all fighting each other, and his, um, uh, one of his uh, army died. And he said, I touched his heart, but it does not beat at all, recognising the relationship between the function of the heart and life. Now, the heart is a truly remarkable organ. It sits in the middle of our chest, and it starts working within days of conception. I'm going to show you that later. It never stops working until we die. It beats 100,000 times a day, 40 million times a year, 3 billion times in an average lifespan. And to me, one of the most amazing things, each time it's pumping, it's pumping blood through a network of 97,000 kilometres vessels inside each of us. That's um, quite a lot better than FedEx managers. <laughs> and most of the time you don't even notice it's there. The heart's special not just because of its form and function, but because it's the, interpreted figuratively as a place of soul, emotion, love and strength and other feelings. The Egyptians held it in great regard, and here it is being weighed against a feather representing uh, truth or divine truth. They held it in such special regard that during embalming they took it out and put it into special jars or back into the body, uh, which at the, the time was um, regarded as a, a high privilege. Better than the brain, they didn't look after that so well. They used to take it out with brain hooks, and I tease my neurosurgical colleagues that they still do the same thing. <laughs> it's certainly not something that I'd recommend you do at home afterwards, like these children. Um, and it is quite nice to see that in fashion the Egyptians still are winning. The heart is special to humans. And in, the, in Chinese philosophy, going right back in Confucian writing, Xin represents heart and mind, the same word, and refers to dispositions or feelings or a sense of intention. In the Rig Veda, in Sanskrit writings, it was a place where moral judgments rest inside your body. And even Empedocles, who started the medical school in Sicily in the 5th century BC, uh, was considered that the heart was not only the most important, but also the seat of the soul. And just across the water, Philolaus got what the, the brain did, called it nous, a great northern word. Didn't quite understand what the heart did, and completely screwed up when trying to work out what the umbilicus did. In the Bible, the heart is mentioned frequently. In the Old Testament, it has a role in philosophy um, and in the intellectual and moral and psychological life of the soul. In the New Testament, it's much more frequently referred to as a seat of wisdom. But maybe it, we had to wait until uh, Al-Khazali, um, about a thousand years ago, uh, an Islamic philosopher who understood and managed to reflect this difference between the figurative concept of the heart and the pump physiologic concept of the heart. He still thought the heart was the monarch of the entire body and was spirit. But he did recognise that there was a muscular organ in the middle of the body. Not soul, not spirit, not emotion, just a pump and at the centre of our circulation. We had to wait till the Renaissance for uh, a real revolution in the way that we looked at the circulation by reasoning, by interfering and by dissection and much more sophisticated concepts of anatomy. Um, this is uh, Galen, who was a Greek physician in the second century AD. And Galen's views dominated. He was post-Hippocratic uh, philosopher, a medical philosopher, and really quite remarkable scientist of his time. But his views went unchallenged for almost 1,500 years. And they were wrong. 
Um, and I just want to show you a clip from a wonderful film with a wonderful accent, uh, which was first made in 1928 and then modified into colour again in 1957 by Sir Henry Dale, who was president of the Royal Society at the time. And I'm going to let this run. It goes for a couple of minutes and um, give me a chance to have a glass of water. But I love the way this sounds. According to Galen's opinion, as it was taught in the 17th century, all the blood in the body originated in the liver. The food passed into the stomach and intestines and there underwent a process known as concoction, as a result of which the refined portion of this food, called chyle, was separated off and conveyed through the portal vein to the liver. There it underwent further concoction and became venous blood. And at the same time, it was endowed with natural spirit and so acquired the power of imparting life and nourishment to all parts of the body. The different parts sucked up the nourishment brought to them and the venous blood ebbed back to the liver for fresh supplies. So a continuous movement of ebb and flow was believed to go on in the veins. From the liver, the vena cava brought the venous blood to the right ventricle of the heart. Some of it was expelled through the pulmonary artery into the lungs for their nourishment, while the remainder passed through porosities in the interventricular septum into the left ventricle. There it met the air which had passed through the lungs and travelled through the pulmonary vein into the left ventricle. This inspired air was thought to have inherent in it the basic principle of life. In the left ventricle of the heart it was believed that a further concoction took place and that the venous blood and the inspired air were refined together to become arterial blood endowed with vital spirit. Arterial blood went out from the left ventricle of the heart through the aorta and from thence into the whole body. At the same time, the fuliginous vapours which were thought to be given off by the concoction of blood and air in the left ventricle were driven back through the pulmonary vein into the lungs and so breathed out of the body. I love this talk. There's some wonderful words, concoction, natural spirit, vital spirit, and that marvellous fuliginous vapours. I'm sure we've all suffered from those at some point. But if I managed to put air into the left ventricle and mix it with blood, I would be struck off the medical register. It's fundamentally dangerous. And his concept of the circulation amazingly lasted for so long, despite multiple anatomists doing dissections of the body during the, those 1,500 years. And it took until the time of Thomas Gresham uh, for scientists really to get to grips with how the circulation worked. Da Vinci, in the century preceding Gresham, did these wonderful anatomic drawings of the heart and really understood the valves of the heart and what they were there for, which I'll show you in a minute. But it wasn't until Vesalius, Columbus and Harvey working in Padova that the real rate of progress in understanding how the circulation worked uh, accelerated. Harvey knew that blood flowed around the body in an essentially unidirectional way from veins to heart, heart to arteries and back round again and was able to demonstrate the presence of valves in the forearm that many of you will have tried to do yourselves or seen at school. But he also got how the pulse worked, and it's said that he saw this by looking at fire engines and recognising the similarity between that and pulsing blood in animals. That relationship between a pump and a pulse and flow uh, is fundamental to what we're going to be talking about. Now Thomas here looks rather doubting, I think, and it's probably because uh, I feel at the moment that what I say may end up being disproved. Certainly my predecessors didn't always get it right. The first professor of physics was Matthew Gwynne in 1597. And that initial decade of the 17th century in London was really quite remarkable. The plague had closed all the theatres. And in 1599, the Globe Theatre reopened. 
The East India Company started in 1600. Queen Elizabeth died in 1603. And then King James came to power and had this really wonderful first piece of public health, a custom loathsome to the eye, hateful to the nose, harmful to the brain, dangerous to the lungs, and I love this bit, and the black stinking fume thereof nearest resembling the horrible Stygian smoke of a pit that is bottomless. He's talking about tobacco. And he was quite prescient. It took over 400 years for it to get to grips with his public health message. (laughs) Then the gunpowder plot, the first act of union debate, currently topical, a second professor of physic in 1607, Peter Mansell, and the Bible in 1611, authorised version. And then came Thomas Winston, our next professor of physic. And in 1620, Matthew Gwynne, the first one, became commissioner for tobacco, described at the time as an unscrupulous government official controlling the licensed trade in traffic in tobacco. That's not a good precedent for me, I don't think. This is the only picture I could find of anything to do with tobacco at the time. It's a, an exhibit here in the Museum of London for opening bales of tobacco. And Harvey published De Mortu Cordis in 1628. The circulation effectively was born. But Thomas Winston, our second professor, third professor of physics, is described in Wikipedia as having made no original discoveries and having no acquaintance with Harvey's work on the circulation. Doesn't set me up very well for the rest of my talk. And he got involved with the tobacco industry as well. So there we are. My predecessors um, didn't exactly help with the public health and um, didn't grasp what Harvey was about. But for all of us who work with children, we can never get away from the miracle that they appear from somewhere. And the whole process of fertilisation of the egg, the growth of the cells, and then the rapid appearance of a baby within the womb. And if you look carefully, you can see a heart beating within a few weeks of of conception. As that baby matures, and by 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 weeks is recognisable, and by the time you're into 18 and 20 weeks, this baby looks on ultrasound remarkably normal. You can see it uh, growing and maturing as those weeks go by. And we operate on babies of this level of maturity from time to time. And it operate indeed in the womb from time to time. At 40 weeks, a beautiful baby is delivered. And then sometimes we have to treat it. So what hap- what, how does this heart in this baby work? Well, this animation from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia talks about that. The blue blood the blood which has had oxygen removed from it, is coming back to the heart through two big veins, superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava, to the right atrium, going through a valve, the tricuspid valve, to a right ventricle, and then out through a valve, pulmonary valve, to the artery, to the lungs, where it divides into two, one to each side, and in the lungs exchanges oxygen and carbon dioxide across the membrane, and the blood goes red again and comes back to the left side of the heart. Now, I can't explain to you what happens in congenital heart disease from a moving diagram like this. It's just not possible. So I've um, constructed a diagram that we can use over and over again for the next part of this talk, um, which shows the heart as a right side in blue and a left side in um, red. The blood comes back to the heart, as we described, is pumped out to the lungs, gets red, comes back to the left side, gets pumped out to the body, and then returns with the oxygen removed from it to the uh, right side. And this goes on and on in a repeating cycle 100,000 times a day. Now, there are many more um, blood vessels in the body than there are in the lung. And so it's got a high resistance. It's hard to push blood through the rest of the body harder than it is to push blood through the lungs. And so as a result, the left side of the heart works harder. It has thicker muscle, stronger muscle, and runs at higher pressures, as you can see here. This would be your conventional blood pressure, but pressures are measured in all of these chambers, much lower on the right side. And yet the same amount of blood, because it's in a loop, is going through each side. So that's what it looks like, and that's what it 
sort of does, but how does it develop? Now, um, I want to thank um, two people here. Um, I want to thank some people. Andrew Cook on the left and um, Mike um, and Jacob, who have done the animation for this film. And uh, their pictures will reappear later. They've done a wonderful job animating this. Um, the moment that the egg is penetrated by the sperm, you immediately get the cell dividing into two, and then four, and then eight. And then the whole thing forms this thing called a morula. It's only half a millimetre across. And those cells sink down to the bottom, surrounded by fluid, and embed themselves in the uh, wall of the uterus. And if we look down on the top of that in just a moment, we see a thing called the embryonic disc, a plate of cells, and their heart starts from these two bits, the left heart field in red and the right heart field in blue, and they move up towards the head end and become the cardiac crescent, now two millimetres across. If we look at those from the side, you can see that they're joined together at the top of the bottom, and the blue bit, the second heart field, donates cells into the right one, and the whole thing loops around, creating two areas of the heart, two ventricles, a right ventricle and a left ventricle, and they balloon up and hollow out at that time and create the structure of the heart. We're still only an embryo five millimetres long. At that stage, the heart is joined onto the old segmental vessels which all of us have, and cells come in from a part of the body called the cardiac neural crest, act like catalysts or labourers coming in to put a partition wall between the outlet ventricles and to remodel all of these areas leaving the heart. They're, they're, they're not the only workers that we call upon at this time. Cells emerge from just north of the liver and grow on the surface of the heart and these become the coronary arteries and coronary veins. Almost simultaneously, um, there's a growth of a vein coming out of the lungs, the pulmonary veins, which carry the blood back from the lungs towards the heart, and that emerges into, this, uh, into the back of the atrium of the heart, which we'll see a few times during the course of this talk. And if we look inside the heart now, where another team of workers are busy, uh, walls are being built between the right side of the heart and the left side to separate it into right and left sides. We're in the right and we're looking through towards the left. And another group of workers are building this area, which separates the top and the bottom of the heart, the atria from the ventricles. These walls grow and complete towards the end of development. And right at the end, a new little hole appears, which is necessary uh, to shunt blood from the placenta through to the left side. And all of this is taking place within the first few days and weeks of conception. Now, I uh, showed you in that wonderful animation um, that has been done, we've got these little thing called the primitive node here, and next to it are these the heart fields from left and right. In fact, what's going on there is really quite remarkable. There is a current moving stuff from right to left that you can see here. And that's driven by single hairs. I don't know if they project very well, but you can see some movement on that screen. And it's rotating, driving things from left to right. And if those single hair cells go wrong, then you have a problem. Your heart has a problem differentiating right from left. And you could end up with the heart on the wrong side, the right-sided structures being on the left. Or you can end up with two right sides or two left sides. And the whole plumbing can be screwed up because of that, just because of that one cell malfunctioning. Now, seeing that wonderful development and that marvellous animation on a big screen is um, a wonderful thing, but it doesn't really help us understand the scale of things. So Andrew Cook made another um, a little film for, for me as well to try and put this in context. I wanted to show you the scale of things. This is a, a heart at birth, and this is where you need your props. So in the little boxes next to you, you'll find a walnut, and all cardiac surgeons know that the heart at birth is the size of a walnut. There it is. That's what we operate on when a newborn baby is born. We operate on the inside of that. This is a heart at 20 weeks. 
halfway through development, where sometimes we do have to develop it. I couldn't afford to put a pound note, pound coin in all your boxes, but that's what it looks like. And this is a heart at 14 weeks, fully formed, fully working. All of that development process is done. And this is the size of the other thing in your box, a grain of rice. You can keep your boxes at the end and the walnut, but you may need to cook the rice. So if you compare those two together, that's the growth from a grain of rice to a walnut, which takes place in those last 20, 26 weeks of pregnancy. Now, when you see that level of complexity, that twisting and reforming and all of the things that can, are involved in the development of the heart, it's not surprising that it's unbelievably difficult for any of us to talk to the next person about what's wrong with the heart or to make a diagnosis which is fundamentally accurate. So um, various anatomists and morphologists over the years have described anomalies of the heart, but it wasn't really until the 1950s and 60s and 70s that any kind of organisation was brought to that process. And what was done was to create something called sequential segmental analysis, where the heart was thought of in three segments, a top bit, the atria, a middle bit, the pumping chambers or ventricles, and the great vessels. And by going through morphologic descriptions of each of those sections, you were able to identify just a few limited patterns or a few ways they could connect and a few things that could be wrong with them in association. And um, at the same time, unfortunately, and quite commonly in medicine, two schools of thought emerged. On the American side, this is rather like the Ryder Cup, on the American side, uh, Dick and Stella Van Prague from um, um, Boston. And on the blue European side was Bob Anderson and his team across Europe. This lot thought that uh, the relations between all of these parts, these three parts were important, and this lot thought the connections between them were most important. And they used to argue all the time at international meetings, and still do, actually, um, their teams. But it's become much more semantic now rather than actually fundamental core structural things. And it wasn't until late 90s, early 2000s that um, the International Nomenclature Society, of which I was the first president, I'm proud to say, managed to pull these two guys together, these two teams of thinking together, and create one diagnostic system which all computers can use to talk to each other, which is critical for outcome analysis. Um, there are thousands of diagnoses, well over 3,700 individual things that can go wrong with your heart when you're born. And when you scroll it by, it's quite scary to see what they look like. Of course, I'm not expecting you to remember this. <laughs> and there's so much to put right for a cardiac surgeon that you rather enjoy this huge repertoire that you have to learn to deal with all of these things. But it's not surprising that it's very, very, very hard for us to understand, very hard to explain, and we end up speaking in code. We don't use those full long terms that you saw. We talk about VSD, ASD, TGA, AVST, corrected transposition. And trying to help a parent or a family understand that complexity is an extremely difficult thing to do. We used to make diagnosis by inference. So here is a baby whose fingers are blue in relation to its parents' pink hands behind. Not enough um, oxygen in the tissues or too much blue blood being distributed. Here's an x-ray of someone with not enough blood going to the lungs. The lungs are darker than this one, which has too much blood going to the lungs. And we might, in the old days, used to use a stethoscope to listen to murmurs like this one or this one and use those sounds to infer what might be wrong with a heart underneath or look at the clues on an electrical ECG. We still use these, but much less. And I'm going to show you in a minute what we do um, to uh, make these diagnoses. Now, I'm not going to tell you about 3,700 things that go wrong with your heart. You'll be glad to hear. But I'm going to tell you about a few because there are principles involved which will kind of reappear during this series of lectures. I don't expect you to grasp all of it, but there are, I hope these principles will stick. The first thing that can happen is that you have abnormal or persistent communications between one side and the other. These are called so-called holes in the heart. And the first one we'll, we'll look at will be a hole between the left atrium and the right atrium. 
You can have this at birth, it's normal at birth, but it usually closes. Now you remember that the resistance to the flow of blood is higher going around the body than it is in the lungs. So if you have a hole here, blood will naturally flow from left to right, mixing the blue and red blood and sending too much blood to the lungs, uh, where the resistance is low, and eventually you close it. If, on the other hand, the resistance to the flow of blood through the lungs is high because there's a disease there or some arterial problem in those lungs, then the flow will reverse and blue blood will go from right to left, mix in the ventricle, and the child will end up with a blue appearance because the blue blood is shifted from one side to the other. And so just looking at the child's hands, you have a feeling that there might be a shunt or not enough functioning lung. Well, the in inference disappeared to a large extent with the invention of the ultrasound system, with ultrasonography, which was uh, Hertz and Edler working in Lund in Sweden, just after I was born again. And the echocardiogram, cardiac echocardiography, came in in 1965. It's not very long ago. Big machine, though. Now it's all got miniaturized because of the digital revolution. And we're able to see things in color and use the Doppler principle to look at the rate of flow, the amount of turbulence, and we can see that in color and hear it in sound. So let's look at an ASD with modern diagnostic techniques, not a stethoscope, not anything else. You saw the diagram before, and in fact, there are several different types of hole you can have between one side and the other. But when you see it on an echocardiogram, you can see the hole in the septum, but it really becomes obvious which way the blood is going, that there's a left to right shunt through that ASD. And we can now even see it in three dimensions, although this is not very helpful in this sort of meeting. It does help the surgeon or the cardiologist work out how you might close this hole. You can also see it on an MRI. So we can put a child in a scanner and we can measure the flow in an MRI scanner. You can see it rushing over through a restrictive ASD here from one side to the other. You can also have holes between the two pumping chambers, a ventricular septal defect. And again, you have high pressures and high resistance on this side, so it's not surprising that blood will flow from left to right and too much blood will go to the lungs. That's what it sounds like, and that's what it looks like when too much blood goes to the lungs. If you carry on having too much blood going to the lungs, the lungs themselves become damaged, and the flow reverses, and the child becomes blue, as blue blood shifts the other way, and then the child's inoperable. So we should operate early. There are multiple types of VSDs, I don't need to show you those, but there are some examples here on an echo where you can see a hole and the flow of blood and in three dimensions. And here, one with multiple ventricular septal defects, again in three dimensions. Curiously similar uh, to Galen's heart. And I often wonder whether he had actually uh, dissected the wrong one when he made his original theories. And here is another one on MR. So we've had holes, false communication. We can also have bits go missing. So if the right ventricle doesn't develop during that complex formation of the heart, or um, you end up with something called an absent right ventricle, and the only way you can survive is for a hole to exist between the right atrium and the left atrium, or, and some sort of communication between the aorta and the artery to the lungs. Otherwise, no blood gets to the lungs at all, and you don't survive. This is usually present at birth, but could be made bigger by us. And this sometimes needs us to provide a little plastic tube. Absence is uncommon. Much more commonly, you have a reduced size of all of these ventricles, a hyperplastic or small right heart, with a high resistance, and so blood goes out that way, making the child blue again. And here you can see that. There's a very small right ventricle, and the blood will flow from right to left across the atrium, and the baby will be blue. One of the things that I'm going to be talking about for a whole sort of other ethical and important political reasons is hyperplastic left heart syndrome, which is a situation where the ventricle is either absent or small, where in this setting, red blood coming back from the lungs has to go across to the atrium, through into the uh, 
right ventricle and the only way you can get blood to flow around the body is by either a natural or man-made connection. That's hypoplastic left heart syndrome when it's very small. And this is a, one of those diagnoses which was seminal in the latter part of the 20th century in determining whether a unit was good or not. You have to create these connections if they don't exist. And here are an echo example of a small left ventricle, tiny here, and you can see the left to right shunt of blood coming across there. This is the same thing on MRI. Uh, MRI, for some reason, projects the wrong way, so I've just turned it round. And I can't work out how to flip it to be in exact alignment with the other ones, but you can still see the principle. There's a small ventricle here and a communication at the atrial level. If you see this as a diagram, this was courtesy of my friends in Cincinnati, you can see the small ventricle and the big right ventricle here, small left, big right, but always associated with this is a very, very small aorta. So these things have associated problems, not just the holes or the underdevelopment. And um, the final group of things I just want to cover is abnormal connections. So that's how it normally looks, but imagine if you had the pulmonary veins joined up to the wrong atrium. Remember that little thing growing out of the back of the lungs and uh, the wonderful animation that Jacob and Mike have done? It comes to the back of this area. Um, if it misses and goes to the wrong part of the atrium, it's going to be connected here, and too much red blood will disappear into this side, and you'll end up with a baby with too much blood going to the lungs, especially if all of the four veins end here. And these babies usually need operating on as an emergency immediately after birth. The final one I want to show you is transposition of the great arteries. I'm going to do this quite quickly. In the normal heart, the aorta leaves the left ventricle. In transposition, it comes off the wrong ventricle, comes off the right. And uh, in this setting, it is uniformly fatal if you don't do something about it, because what happens is that the blue blood coming back from the body comes back to the right atrium, goes to the right ventricle, comes out of the aorta, and then just goes around in a neat little circle progressively using up any available oxygen. On the left side, blood is being pumped out to the lungs, gets a bit of oxygen, but just goes round and round and round and round again. That would kill you if you didn't have some sort of communication, either there or there, to produce what's called mixing. And we can make this little hole with a balloon, and we can make this uh, by keeping open a thing called the ductus, which is there at birth using a drug. And then later on, as you'll see next time, we can swap those great vessels around and, um, and essentially cure the baby. So I've shown you some anatomy. I've shown you some views of that anatomy. But I think it's important to realise that every one of us will have a different perception of what we've seen. So uh, I imagine some of you will have seen this before. But if I ask you what colour A is and what colour B is, what are your answers going to be? What colour is A? You could say dark or light. Dark, so light. And B? Yeah, OK. In, actually, they're the same colour. And the reason that we perceive them is what our brain is doing. In the presence of that shadow from the green object, it's making inferences about the colours of those things based on what we expect to see. It's really important when you look at the images that a specialist is generating for you that you make the correct inferences from that information. Now, it's, I'm, I've tried not to show you a significant amount of operations, but I'm going to show you one. Because the cardiologist and the surgeon see different anatomy. They have a different perception. So I showed you what the cardiologist is seeing on an echocardiogram, and they're seeing this essentially most of the time in two dimensions. And they're creating an image in their own head out of those two-dimensional slices, and they're expecting me as a surgeon to understand that as well. What I see in the operating room is something completely different. That's what the same, this is the same condition on the left, an atrioventricular septal defect, as it is on the right. But do they look the same? Is it easy to grasp? Our actual view of it is different from the way the cardiologists look at it. So I have to not only 
understand it, but transpose it in three dimensions and in a different angle. And for decades, that was the biggest challenge. Building teams that could understand each other well enough to go to the operating room and just sort it out. Recently, imaging has taken an enormous leap forward with three-dimensional scanning. And this is a, a, a child who has an art coronary artery which is coming from the wrong origin. This is the artery to the lungs. Here's the correct origin. Uh, this is the artery coming from the aorta. And the left coronary artery, instead of coming from there, is coming from the artery to the lungs. This results in very poor ventricular performance, and we have to move it. But you can actually work out how you might do the operation because you, it looks like that in three dimensions and we could rotate this in space and even print it to understand it. Here are the outflow tracts, part of the right ventricle in a lot of patients who've had previous surgery in real time beating so that we can understand that individual patient's anatomy and individual patient's measurements and even print those individual components in three dimensions so that we can work out what that individual child needs and prepare devices that are exactly the right size that can be implanted, for example, by a catheter from the groin uh, without having to have surgery at all. And we can rehearse it. We can practice. And practice is really important. In the old days, we just used to have to go and try it out in the operating room. But these days, more options appear. As I said before, uh, ability to correct the many congenital heart disease defects that occur has paralleled the length of my life. Now, if I think that Gresham time from 1597 has represented 12 hours, then that represents just one and a half hours of Gresham time. Quite remarkable progress that's been made in that short era of life. I've talked to you quite a lot about um, the heart today. I don't expect you to remember it, but what I hope I've done is to give you a slight sense of wonder about its role, about its history, about what we can now do to diagnose it, and give you a teaser for what we might be able to do to fix it. I hope you can remember every one of these slides as they go by. <laughs> um, and um, in just a moment... There, very straightforward. I want to thank all of the people who've helped me prepare this. Um, without my family, and uh, Tilly and Andrew and Andrew, Jacob and Matt, who have done that brilliant animation and worked themselves stupid over the last three weeks, I really can't thank them enough. And for everybody else who's been involved in preparing this, thank you. Uh, the next talk is going to be about heart surgery for congenital heart defects. Is that science or an art? I want to discuss in that one not just what we can do and a little bit about how we can do it, but about some of the characteristics of the early people who started that job and the ones who are doing it now. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>